The CEO industry now gives priority to faces and personalities over voice acting talent. That the CEO industry has been changing in the last couple of years is a given. Fans, especially those that have been supporting Sayu for a couple of years, or even those more curious or sensitive to it, will notice those changes. But what do Sayu themselves have to say about those changes? And how did 2020 almost completely ruined the lives of Sayu? Let's kick off this episode of Sayu Lounge. <laughs> host Vanessa and today's topic is The Drastic Sayu Industry Changes According to Sayu Themselves, Part 1. Now, this is not a new topic explored on Sayu Lounge. In 2020 and 2021, I covered in quite some detail how much the Sayu industry now wants Sayu to become talento, basically jacks of all trades, full-on entertainers more so than voice professionals. But that was based on my observations plus insight from a couple of people currently working in the CU and music industries in Japan. I was asked not to reveal their names and will abide by it, but do know that the information in those episodes was as close to the source as I could get. However, you and I talked about those changes in the CU and music industry, mostly from a fan's perspective or especially for those episodes mixing a fan's perspective with the professional's perspective. But something was missing. The Sayu's perspective. And that's the one I believe matters most. Now, I haven't interviewed anyone, I wish, but it is insanely hard to get an interview with Sayu. But there have been articles published by Business Insider and Oricon, both trustworthy sources of information and non-tabloids about the changes in the Sayu industry. Two veteran Sayu legends in the industry gave their honest opinions about how much the industry has changed for them since they started working as voice actors, something that in one case takes us back to the early 90s. And some even waited on how 2020's COVID-19 pandemic almost killed the dreams of many Sayu and quite possibly made a lot of voice actor hopefuls completely give up on such a career. So the two insights I bring are from Megumi Ogata's interview for Business Insider and Koichi Yamadera's interview for Oricon News. Yeah, I know, Megumi Ogata wouldn't normally fit the scope of Seiyu Lounge, as she is a female Seiyu. But her insights are in-depth and quite thought-provoking, so I want to give you a few of her thoughts together with my analysis. In the next episode, I'll cover Koichi Yamadera's opinion. In this way, you get the opinions from two different sides of the Seiyu industry, male and female. Let's not kid ourselves, the CU industry treats men and women differently, so to get Ogata and Yamadera's perspectives is, hopefully, a good way for you to know what is happening and how each side sees those changes. Also, do know that the information in this episode and in the next one is relatively fresh at the moment of recording this episode. It's from September and October 2021. There is a direct link to the interview in Japanese in this episode's description, so make sure to read more about this topic in there. First off, for those that do not know, who is Megumi Ogata? Basically, she is a legend among Seiyuu. She is best known for voicing the protagonist in the Evangelion anime series, which opened the doors for her career to bloom. She's also been an accomplished solo artist since 1996 and a lyricist that writes not only for her solo career, but also for other artists. She's also well known for being vocal about the issues in the Sayu industry, having written about those in her autobiography published a couple of years ago. So we have here one rare case of a Sayu not really bound by the politics and mind games of the voice acting industry in Japan. Someone that is willing to talk and put a spotlight on its issues 
in order for others to better understand our job and what being a voice actor in Japan entails. Now that we are past this quick introduction, let's cover some of the topics in that interview. So you suddenly have to show their face. Ogata mentioned that when she was in her 20s, back in the 90s, she was all excited and filled with energy to give her all to voice acting. She mentioned that she didn't understand why, all of a sudden, she had to show her face. So you were supposed to be in the background, they were not expected to show their face. Until the third boom of voice actors which prompted the launch of several voice actor magazines and those demanded photos. Fans started to expect and demand photos of Sayu. And thus, being a voice actor all of a sudden was about showing the face alongside using their voice. At the same time, becoming a solo artist was becoming a trend, with more and more Sayu being asked to kick off a solo career in order to become popular. This was something that puzzled Ogata. She added, I didn't really understand why I had to suddenly show my face and do various things. And she was right, say you hadn't trained for those things. Some even chose to become voice actors because they were shy and not really comfortable showing their faces. And all of a sudden, they had to do so in order to comply with the changes that the industry was undergoing. She added that she didn't find her voice to be suitable for anime and it lacked the sparkle that most female seiyuu are required to have. Dubbing foreign movies was something that appealed to her, however she had to embrace not what she wanted to do at that time, but what she desperately needed to do to stay afloat in the seiyuu industry. Having to be active just for the sake of it. Ogata's big break was in the TV series Neo Genesis Evangelion. That role would end up putting Ogata among the most iconic seiyuu in the industry. She mentioned that when seiyuu reach their 30s, contrary to people in other jobs, they can't be thinking about settling or living a quieter life. That doesn't happen. So you are constantly, almost desperately, trying to be active in their 30s because to have the opportunity of nailing an audition or even getting a role, they have to show previous work done. Besides their big roles, they have to show their most recent work. Ogata mentioned that adding up to that constant stress looming over her was the fact that she had become freelance in her 30s and things did not go well at all. The pace is quite accelerated for Sayu in their 30s. Basically, every day they are getting older in the eyes of anime directors. Almost every year, new talents appear with the traits that directors are looking for, especially taking into account the current trends. Every day, Sayu are running and running, chasing a new role, no matter how small it is, just in order to stay afloat. Ogata mentions that quiet and the opportunity to settle down only appeared in her 40s. That's when she started noticing a change of pace in her career. Still, she asked herself, I wonder if what I'm doing is good enough. Quite possibly because she had to impress anime directors. Candidly, Ogata added that fate and luck do not appear in front of you. There is a flow in the seiyuu industry. And if you, as a seiyuu, go against that flow, there is not much you can do to return to a good place. It's impossible to know when a seiyuu's next big chance to shine will come. When they will be invited to auditions. When their voices will be wanted for a project. And even if you put in the effort, that doesn't always mean you are going to be successful as the anime may fail for a number of reasons or even fans of such anime may not even like you, the seiyuu, at all. Ogata adds that whenever she has the opportunity to share her insights with seiyuu trainees, she always mentions that effort and how unfair the seiyuu industry is. 
in a way, I believe this is the brutal honesty that is seriously lacking in the Sayu industry and that all trainees should know about. This way, if politics favors and flows to follow is too much to deal with for someone that just wants to inspire people or make children and adults smile through acting, then it is the right moment to choose to do something different. While brutal, that is the truth that no one will initially tell trainees. And in a way, Ogata telling these prepares and helps steal the resolve of Sayu, knowing that they are playing a game that they can't win unless they have power. Wanting to pass her values to the next generations. In order to pass on her experiences, Ogata launched a private school called Team Barebo At. She mentions that she doesn't have a particular motivation to teach others to act, as she believes that is something that can't be taught, instead it is learned and honed by each seiyu. The focus when teaching seiyu should be on knowing how to vocalize and be physical in their acting as well as have physical training to avoid injuries in the future. Ogata aims to teach the reality of the voice acting industry in Japan with the help of friends in the industry that currently have teaching jobs. According to Ogata, before the pandemic, as long as a CEO had a good amount of sensibility, an acceptable appearance and was honest, they could get an opportunity. Now, especially after the pandemic, she mentions that there are many young people that worry if they can continue doing this job forever due to how uncertain it is as a field of work. While there are now more ways to join the voice acting industry than ever before, being a YouTuber, singer, actor, radio host, model, etc., the competition is much more and there are details deciding who makes it or not into the industry and manages to have a successful career. The music and voice acting industries were severely hit by the pandemic. This is true for all industries in the world, however, let's focus on voice acting and singing as those are the main topics of this episode and, ultimately, this podcast. According to Ogata, the Japanese government created a subsidy for artists to apply for in order to cover for some of the expenses that come with cancelling shows. This, according to Ogata, was extremely complex, was difficult to apply for, not to mention it barely covered a thing. Setting up a show is expensive. The other option for musicians struck by the pandemic was to shift to live streaming. According to Ogata, the initial cost for the live streaming equipment and the infection control measures for the staff involved in the streaming was too high that the ticket revenue would never make up for those expenses. Ogata adds that it is hard to prepare a new project, live show, an album, etc. If you don't have money, such is the life of a musician, even one that comes from a SAU background. Since spring 2021, the situation has become even more difficult for musicians. According to Ogata, that is because it is no longer just about financing the performance itself. If you try to rent a studio to practice, many studios or event spaces are closed. If artists limit themselves to studios of 80 square meters or more in the city center, 80% of those are closed. She adds that even if you are lucky enough to rent a studio, there is a limit on the number of people who can use it to avoid crowds in the rehearsal room. For example, you can only have up to 11 people in a 100 square meter studio where, back in the day, 30 staff and cast members were able to enter. In that case, we would have to find a larger space and the cost of rehearsals would be higher than ever. This shows that recording music and even anime series has gotten increasingly more expensive due to the pandemic. Ogata continues, Before the pandemic, I would be able to rent a rehearsal studio for 3000 yen per hour, but now it costs 1500 yen per hour, five times the cost. 
Due to those expenses, Ogata mentioned that to cover those, she does anime recordings and dubbing, but there is a limit as to how much money she can earn from those to cover her expenses. She wraps up by saying that if it is hard for her, already established as a singer and with a long career as a CU, then it is going to be really difficult for young talents to live and work in this industry. The impact of the pandemic will be felt for years. Young voice actors have been hit really hard by the pandemic. Opportunities for new voice actors plummeted and anime advertising drastically decreased. It is more expensive to make anything. Ogata mentions that in the CU industry, there has always been a system to help nurture newcomers. While in the studio, newcomers, stars and veterans all collaborated and learned from each other. Now newcomers have no one to follow and learn from, given that the recordings are split and there are barely any recordings with a full cast present. She says that newcomers could learn even from watching the veterans work, but right now there aren't any opportunities, so newcomers have to learn everything alone. With that being said, Ogata adds that if newcomers are not ready because they can't get that experience, anime producers look for the tried and true talents already active in the industry for their projects. This way, they avoid bringing in a voice actor that doesn't know what they are doing. This is the point at which it gets overwhelmingly difficult for rookies to debut and thrive. Anime recordings have changed their dynamics. Before the pandemic, every single seiyuu would follow recording slots decided by the studios. Usually there were two time slots, morning with recordings starting at 10 am and afternoon with recordings starting at 4 pm. Say you were free to choose out of both the time slot in which they were available to record their lines. Auditions also followed the same format. For example, the audition would say that recording would start at 4 pm, so those that have a slot open can come and try to get the role. Things changed with the pandemic and since 2020, recordings are done individually or with the fewer members of the cast possible in the studio. As such, there are too many one-takes and unrecorded recordings in which Seiyu basically recorded their lines without any other people around them or any other lines recorded, something that makes it vastly more complex on the production side of the anime industry. Before the pandemic, when a popular actor rejected a role or didn't manage to have available time for a role, producers would give a chance to newcomers or Seiyu with less experience to shine and lead the way, to gain experience. Now, if a popular actor rejected a role or had a conflicting schedule, the producers look for the next big star to cover for them, not giving an opportunity to younger voice actors to shine. These changes, however, arrived to take away the chances for the younger generations to thrive and grow. Recordings now feel impersonal. Ogata mentions that she now enters the studio on time, immediately goes into the booth to record and then goes home. There is no interaction with the director, staff and other voice actors. She adds that even if there are online events to promote the anime, the voice actors will only be asked about the post-recording, not the recording because nothing happens beyond recording and going straight home my take on this interview. After reading and, in a way, adapting the interview to this episode, I feel like it only further validates the issues and vices of the seiyu industry. Megumi Ogata doesn't really mince words in her depiction of the industry and its issues, or even how the industry can get better. That is rare and to have someone this vocal in the voice acting industry helps us, fans, get to know what our favorite CU go through and that they are not allowed to mention, as well as the lack of technological advancement that some parts of the industry have and how that is deeply affecting the CU industry a couple of years after the lockdown phase. Many CU have said before, joining the industry is not easy. 
The first challenges appear in the auditions to join a talent agency, then in those to be signed to the agency, later on auditions for anime series, then the politics, the mind games and all the dirty stuff that goes behind the curtains, propelling some seiyuu to stardom while others, perhaps more talented, don't get those chances. But those are, unfortunately, predictable things. But a pandemic arrived out of nowhere, stopping the world for four solid months, and making Sayu drop out of their job, sell their house, live under a bridge, ask for loans to pay their bills, and turn into Uber drivers to be able to pay their bills, turn into YouTubers in hopes that will continue to help them be relevant, uh, that was not expected. Having to pay five times as much for studio time as a solo artist, or even not having the opportunity to learn from the best voice actors in the industry, due to the restricted number of people inside the studio, has reduced a lot of the opportunities for new talents to come and shine. Many Sayu found themselves struggling, and as Megumi Ogata said, the ripple effect of the pandemic will be felt for years to come in the Sayu industry. Who knows when something will change again for the better. Why did this all happen? The pandemic couldn't have been predicted or countered, but think with me for a second. If Sayu were well paid to begin with, they would have just enough money saved to support themselves through months of no work. That is something that, for example, Soma Saito has mentioned before in an interview. Sayu experience quite regularly months and months of no work. While we see that anime, games, CDs, books and magazines are being released monthly featuring our favorite Sayu, they actually recorded everything and went to photo shoots all in the same time period for those, and as such, they may spend months without having work after that. This testimony is just like Ogata's, all the more interesting, as Saito is easily up there with some of the best paid Seiyu currently in the industry, and even he mentioned how it can be frustrating not having money for seasons and seasons of anime, especially if a Seiyu doesn't get a regular role. A solid career in the music industry can help lessen the burden, but in 2020, no one in the Japanese music industry was ready for what happened. All this to say that if the CU industry paid better to their CU, part of the struggles could have been avoided. Then the fact that the CU industry and the adjacent to the music industry were so focused on the in-person events and work, while the rest of the world was already surrendering itself to live streaming and remote work, made it so that it was a massive shock for the whole industry that, all of a sudden, for them, couldn't work in the same office. Adapting to remote recordings should have been done earlier, and it would have spared some of the losses the anime industry went through during that period, negatively impacting Seiyuu themselves. And let's not even imagine how many young talents may have given up becoming Seiyuu during that period. Moving to Tokyo is insanely hard, and it usually goes hand in hand with living precariously because rent is ridiculously high. Finding a job during the pandemic was almost impossible. The Japanese society was not ready to go fully digital that soon, and thus, we do not even know how many awesome talents the industry may have lost during those four months or even that full year. Now tell me, do you see any changes in the CU industry since the 2020 pandemic? Or do you think nothing really changed in the end? Let me know in the comments on YouTube and remember, leave your comments as complex or as simple as they may be and you can be featured on upcoming episodes of CU Lounge. Hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed this episode and don't want to miss the hand that feeds HQ's weekly mail CU and music related content. I'll return next week with another episode of Sayu Lounge. Thank you for listening and see you guys around. <laughs>